everyone. This is David Hilscher. I'm your science therapist trying to get you to the land of becoming a critical thinker. Yeah, I'm not here to tell you the truth. I'm, ha- I'm here to help you try to find it. Today, we have a great talk com- uh, from our third in our series with Dr. James Maxlow. But I'm David Hilscher. I'm one of the directors of the CMPS. <clears throat> and also, you may know me because you may be on my channel, a subscriber to Dissident Science. <music> Yeah, I want to thank all my subscribers, Dissident Science. I've been super busy, but I think these uh, interviews have been filling in quite nicely, meeting people that you've not met before, very great thinkers, people who are critical thinkers around the world. We've had numerous people on. In fact, we're lining new people up. In fact, I have just confirmed Glenn Borkert for two talks on Infinity and the Big Bang. So that's going to be a really great look for the coming Saturdays uh, for that. And of course, today we have Dr. James Maxlow. Um, he's still getting here. He's in Perth. I see him coming into the green green room. The poor guy has to get up at what's 10 p.m. and it's pe- way past his bedtime. He's at my age. He should be he should be sleeping, uh, I know, or at least in a bar somewhere drinking something. But we're really honored to have him speak again. This is a th- this is his third talk in the series, and uh, uh, I am going to. Of course, show some slides like I always uh, do for those people who are new to this sort of format every Saturday morning. We do it at 10 a.m. on Saturday because it is the prime time. Why? Because 10 a.m. seven that's 7 a.m. on the West Coast of the United States, 10 a 10 a.m. on the East Coast. It's about, let's see, 5, 3 p.m. in Europe. And you go all the way to Perth on the West Coast of, of Australia and you get. 12 hours. So, and then you have that big ocean in between. Thanks to, thanks to Dr. James Maxwell. In fact, the earth is expanded because of him. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) He's laughing right now. I know, but uh, let me just, I always have a few slides. I tell people about what we're doing here. These are Saturday science chats. They've been going on since 2008. It's sponsored by the John Chappelle Natural Philosophy Society and Dissident Science. Yes, I am streaming live to Dissident Science. Hello all my, to my, all my scribers. And uh, let's move to the next slide. There we go. The CNPS mission is to be an organization that, above all, promotes critical thinking without malice, to be an organization that supports, publishes, and prom- promotes serious scientific work outside mainstream science, to provide a forum for open debate about modern topics in physics, cosmology, philosophy, and mathematics, to provide a forum for presenting serious papers and theories without fear of censorship and very important to be run and controlled in, in its entirely by paid members membership, including the election of its directors and its members. That means they could oust me someday. <laughs> Give me some time off. But uh, anyways, it's a great community. If you want to go online, this community is hopping, man. I mean, we're lots of great discussions. I'm jumping in. This is a wonderful place. We're getting lots of new people. I'm really glad to see it. This is our new website. Um, and you just jump in there, and the first thing you see is an activity feed, feed of people discussing all kinds of things, people starting new groups. We've got a big bang group for uh, that's going to be coming up with uh, Dr. Glenn Borker in a number of weeks, and uh, lots of stuff. My father and I, I arguing about particles and all that kind of stuff, but check it out. Uh, please become you know a member, but if you want to see what it's all about, go to naturalphilosophy.org, and you can check it out. It's a active, and we recommend uh, 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 recommend. We recommend you try it out and sign up. So how can you participate in support? Well, you can sign up for naturalphilosophy.org. You can consider becoming a member. Very important. It's a couple thousand dollars a year to do all this stuff. Even StreamYard here is $200 a year. And it really gives us all these new places to get out there in, in social media because that's where everything is happening. You can sit there and not like that if you're an old student say, oh, I don't like it. I don't like Facebook and YouTube. Well, guess what, folks? That's where the world is. And if you want to get your information out there, if you've got great work to show, that's where they are. Also, you want to participate in our community dis- discussions on our website. Just log in. Uh, we do ask you to put a photo. You have to put your real name in a photo. If you don't do that, we do not allow you because we do not uh, like an- anonymity because that's one way people on social media can uh, go in and just wreak havoc. We, we, are, we believe in our philosophy and our rules is just face-to-face combat in the good sense 
and we need a picture of you and uh, your real and full name. And people have been cooperating because they want to get out there. And also, of course, you can post news and happenings on social media about us, share our links, subscribe to our, our YouTube channel. Um, our websites, of course, are nationalphilosophy.org. If you're really new to this, check out sciencewoke.org. Man, we've got a lot of views on that, um, a lot of great articles. It's online magazine for critical thinkers. Uh, and if you don't know what's wrong with mainstream science, we even have a place, all the problems with mainstream science. You can click on that and read all kinds of articles about it. If you're a writer and you are in the dissident community or critical thinking community, you want to be part of that, we're always welcome to new people writing for that magazine. Of course, we have a wiki as well, wiki.naturalvelocity.org. uses the exact same software as Wikipedia, which is open source called MediaWiki. And uh, we have over 10,000 pages there. And so you can find quite a lot of stuff there. And coming are Chappelle University courses in natural philosophy. We founded that in 2018. And we've got one person already writing uh, courses for that. And, and if you have a course you'd like to write about, uh, in fact, our, our uh, guest speaker today and a member of our group, uh, actually a Lifetime Achievement Award winner, <laughs> that's the, the least we can do, uh, is James, Dr. James Maxlow. And he is going, <clears throat> he better teach a course because for some reason, the universities aren't letting the expansion tectonics in. <clears throat> so you want to be checking that out. That's coming in the future. Just a couple of commentary. I've, I've, I've done this one before. Why do we support everyone? Uh, it's not, it, it isn't the, isn't there only one accepted model? People say, yeah, I mean, all science, we all accept the periodic table. Yeah, we do, but we're right now in a science revolution because universities do not do that. If you go to university and you want to write, your thesis on expansion tectonics, good luck. Why is that? Well, it's because universities don't major in critical thinking. They major in dogma, dogma. They major in telling you what the truth is. And if you don't follow that truth, then you're no good, especially in physics and cosmology. A lot of other, other um, uh, tectonics, plate tectonics, same thing. Um, change comes, of course, from dissent and uh, not from groupthink. CNPS, CNPS gives a platform to everyone who, who's in that boat and, and not from groupthink, of course. And history decides all this, folks. <clears throat> you know, everybody should be out there, of course, doing their stuff, but we don't decide, nor do the universities, nor do the science evangelists or the journalists. Uh, and as Dr. Alexander Unsker, which I hope to get on here, he is an amazing person. If you haven't read his book, The Higgs Fake, read it. If you think that they're doing real science and particle accelerates, Think again, guys. If you sent NASA astronauts, not astronauts, NASA scientists or SpaceX scientists to the Large Hadron Collider and had them sit down and evaluate the, the way they do stuff, they would be thrown out in about 10 minutes. So read read Alexander Unsker's stuff. And like he says, just keep working on what you're doing. Um, so that's my commentary. Oh, this is actually three. I'm sorry. Uh, expansion. Uh, I should have uh, saw that part, but this is expansion tectonics three uh, out of four with Dr. James Maxwell. If you don't know who he is, he's a retired professional geologist who worked as a mining and exploration geologist throughout much of Australia. So yeah, he knows geology. During that time, he returned to Curtin University of Technology in Perth, Western Australia to study and research expansion tectonics. Uh, he was very lucky to be able to do that. And from this research, he gained a Master of Science degree and in 1995, followed by a PhD. Amazing. And uh, if you haven't seen it, he has uh, asked me to tell you about this really great site, expansiontectonics.com. Where do you go for expansion tectonics? Expansiontectonics.com. Here's the, uh, the front page here, uh, homepage of, of the website and all those amazing models there. Just chocked full of stuff. So, um, and also he wrote, in my opinion, the most important book in geology ever written. And he's the most important geologist ever written, ever written. <laughs> oh yes, actually he's a deep fake. He doesn't exist. We've invented him in the AI labs. And what you're seeing today is, no, I'm kidding. You know, now I'm gonna have a thousand people here uh, claiming that this is all fake. 
<laughs> it isn't fake, believe me. Because uh, sometimes if you ask a question that he doesn't like, goes, that's a that's a weird question. It, that deep fake wouldn't do that. So this is a real live guy, amazing, amazing mind. So um, if you haven't ch checked it out beyond plate tectonics, you notice he doesn't say. You know, he could have been less polite in that that title. I'm sure. Uh, beyond plate tectonics, sign, signposts that this is something more advanced than basic academic courses might cover. While the subtitle of unsettled Unsettling Settled Science confirms our suspicions about the book, of course. The whole book is all revolutionary and new, unsettling to anyone who thinks there will be no more major revisions in Earth science. Boy, is that the understatement of the century, maybe of various centuries? It is, it is just as stimulating to those people who understand that scientific discovery will never be finished. Of course, I'm now going to bring up the man himself, uh, Dr. James Maxlow. Hey, hey, James, how are you doing? Yeah, uh, good. Thanks, David. Yes, I've just unmuted. I'm not a, I'm not, I'm not a robot. I just pressed the I'm not a robot button. <laughs> well, you know, what's really amazing today is you can take anybody and live now, put their face up there and get their voice and just say what you want. I've never tried it, but, you know, I may do that. Uh, maybe I'd like to do and get Einstein up there and then talk about how his theory is wrong that would blow people's minds so but um i'm really amazed like i said um you're an oldster more oldster like me in your 60s and yet here you are with decent lighting your face is well placed in the in the in the uh, picture here and you have i guess a nice microphone and two screens this is <laughs> The, I, I, if you would have told me, though. yeah, if you would have told me this about James Maxlow about, you know, a year ago, I would have laughed my head off. But you are a welcome to the uh, age. I'm going to let you go forward with this. Um, I just think, is this a mere coincidence? Uh, that's what the title of your talk today, correct? That's correct, yes. Okay, why don't you get your screen ready to share here while we, uh, we wait for him to get that screen, and then I'm going to throw that up with him. And... Uh, get that moving along but uh he'll be talking again about mere coincidence so um, um do i need to do anything for you let's see can you share your screen i'm just allowed yeah okay all right good i'm going to remove this here okay we see it so take it away dr james maxwell okay <clears throat> Hello, everyone, and welcome to my third of four podcasts on expansion tectonics. In my previous two podcasts, I focused on modelling seafloor and continental crusts in order to create spherical scale models of the ancient Earth, extending from the present day back to the early Archean, plus one model at five million years into the future. From this research, it was concluded that the extensive geological mapping evidence and empirical modeling studies more than adequately demonstrate that an increasing radius Earth is indeed a viable and demonstrable tectonic process. This is all very well, but as, as Shields so astutely mentioned in 1997, ultimately world reconstructions must be congruent not only with the data from geology and geophysics, but also with paleobiogeography, paleoclimatology, and paleogeography. What this means is that if the primary gl global observational data do not fit the small Earth models, then it is the models that must be wrong, not the data. Until now, this modern data has only been investigated from a conventional plate tectonic perspective. And unbeknownst to most people, if the data doesn't fit conventional plate theory, then ad hoc theories are generally proposed to make the data conform. The primary focus of this and my following fourth talk will be to show you a selection of modern global observational data utilised in my research studies to highlight how this data interacts with the small earth models, as well as what this data has to say about the formation and subsequent geological history of the Earth. I must once again emphasize that the research presented here is a data modeling exercise, not a theory modeling exercise, which will focus on modeling 
modern global observational data independently of any present or pre-existing theory. Previous crustal modelling studies have shown that on, on an increasing radius Earth, until about 250 million years ago, there were no modern oceans, only ancient continental seas, about here. During that same time, continental crust ex existed as a complete crustal shell encompassing the entire ancient Earth. The outlines and configurations of the exposed lands making up the supercontinents were then dictated by the presence of and changes to these ancient seas. The transition from ancient seas to modern oceans came about when the Pangaean supercontinent first started to rupture and break up during the late Permian, some 250 million years ago. Small earth modelling studies show that the volume of ocean water has also been increasing steadily since Archean times and most prominently since crustal breakup and opening of the modern oceans. It is suggested that this increase in volume of water occurs in conjunction with increase with intrusion of new volcanic seafloor crust along the newly established global network of mid-ocean ridge spreading centres. This new water, as well as accompanying atmospheric gases, is inferred to represent escaped volatile elements which occur naturally within the crystal lattices of all molten volcanic rocks. Complicating this geographical process is that major changes in sea levels also occurred during merging of two or more ancient continental seas, as well as breakup of the ancient supercontinents and opening of each of the modern oceans. Major changes in sea levels then represent a realistic mechanism for periods of mass extinction of ancient plant and animal species. On all pre-Triassic small earth models, the ancient crusts existed as a complete continental crustal shell encompassing the entire smaller radius earth. Prior to the early Triassic times, exposed supercontinental lands were defined by a superimposed network of continental seas coinciding with sedimentary basins. The primordial Archean supercontinental assemblage is shown here, along with the Archean equator and poles located using published paleomagnetic pole data. Shallow continental seas were present during this time, which coincides with the distribution of khaki colored proterozoic orogenic rocks shown on this image these colours here. The named remnants of the present day modern continents are also highlighted as black lines. During these early Archean times, it is envisaged that once the primitive crust had cooled and stabilised, an increase in earth radius then initiated global scale cracking and fracturing of the crust, localised primarily within a network of orogenic activity and crustal weakness. This network of crustal weakness and, and fracturing was subsequently intruded by renewed granite magma or intrusion of primitive volcanic lava. The tonalite, trondromite, granodiorite group of granite rocks common to all Archean terrains throughout the world may be related to this event. During the latter part of this primordial supercontinental phase, Proterozoic sedimentary basins were slowly filling to capacity over the extremely long period of time operative during these ancient times. These sedimentary basins and relatively shallow seas are, are again shown as khaki coloured orogenic rocks on this image. These geological changes then evolved imperceptibly into the better known Rodinia supercontinent. Rodinia is represented here by the late Proterozoic small earth model at about 800 million years ago. The assemblage and distribution of the remnant modern continents are again shown as black outlines, along with the Proterozoic magnetic poles and equator. The Proterozoic in particular is characterised by the presence of very large stable sedimentary platform basins, 
forming relatively shallow seas with a low elevation contrast between the drylands and the seas. During these extended Precambrian times, the ancient North and South Poles were located within what are now Northern China and West Africa, uh, respectively. West Africa, China. Similarly, the ancient equator passed through what is now North America, East Antarctica, Australia, Greenland and Scandinavia. As can be seen from both the Archean and Rodinia small earth models, the change from one supercontinent to the other is progressive and evolutionary, and this theme will continue to follow through to the following Gondwana and Pangaea supercontinents. Gondwana is shown here, reconstructed on the Ordovician small earth model at about 460 million years ago. In this figure, the distributions of ancient continental seas plotted from published coastline geographical data are also shown as shaded blue areas, and the various ancient continental seas and supercontinents are located and named. On small earth models, during Gondwana times, the earth was undergoing a steady to rapid increase in radius and surface area, and was also fast approaching crustal rupture and breakup. This Gondwanan crustal assemblage retains the same configuration of cratons, origins and basins as seen on the earlier Rodinia and Archean supercontinents. The only difference being the greater surface area of surrounding sedimentary basins and hence aerial distribution of continental seas. This crustal assemblage is retained still further in time until initiation of crustal rupture and breakup of the pan-global continental crust during the late Permian times. During Gondwana times, the small earth South Pole was still located within central West Africa, down here, in what was then South Gondwana. The North Pole was also still located within northern China, in what was then part of the Tethys Sea. The ancient equator passed through East Antarctica, Central Australia, North America, Central Eurasia and India through what was then North Gondwana. The late Paleozoic to early Mesozoic times coincided with breakup of the Gondwana supercontinent and it was accompanied by draining of the continental Tethys, Panthalassa and Iapetus seas as the modern oceans began to open. As a result of draining of these seas, each of the Gondwana and related supercontinents geographically merged with the smaller Laurentia, Baltica and Larusia subcontinents and to form the more familiar Pangaea supercontinent, shown here on the Permian small earth model. This figure again shows the continental seas as shaded blue areas and the various supercontinents and intervening seas existing at the time are also named. Following rupture of the supercontinental crust, Pangaea eventually broke up during the late Permian and dispersed as the modern continents during Triassic to present day times. This post-Pangaea interval of time also saw large apparent shifts in the location of the North and South Poles and Equator, occurring as a direct result of opening of the modern oceans and apparent migration of the modern continents. Paleomagnetics is used in conventional studies to establish an apparent polar wander path for each crustal fragment in order to constrain positioning of the fragmented crusts during assemblage on a static radius Earth. The modelling studies presented here do not generate apparent polar wander paths and hence do not rely on paleomagnetics to constrain assemblage of the ancient crusts. These modelling studies and assemblages are instead governed solely by geology. The locations of present day to Archean magnetic poles, shown here on each of the small earth models, were located using data from the International Paleomagnetic Database of McAlini and Locke, 1996. Plotting this data on each small earth model consistently shows that approximately 95% of the pole data plot within 25 degrees radius of each diametrically opposed magnetic north and south pole location. The small earth model shown on this 
and the following figure are centred on the north and south poles respectively and also include the anticipated polar regions shown as shaded blue circles. It is significant to again note that the distribution of mean north and south poles plotted independently on each small earth model show that each pole plots as diametrically opposed north and south poles with no requirement for apparent polar wander as they should do. The magnetic north pole is shown here located in northern China and it remained throughout there throughout pre in and into early Paleozoic times. These models here. As the Apangean supercontinent ruptured during the late Permian and the various northern continents slowly migrated south, the distribution of north pole locations shows there was then an apparent northward migration of the magnetic pole through Siberia to its present location within the Arctic Ocean, down here. Similarly, the magnetic South Pole is shown located in West Central Africa, and it remained there throughout the Precambrian and early Paleozoic times. As the Pangaean supercontinent ruptured and the various southern continents slowly migrated north, the distribution of South Pole locations shows there was an apparent southward migration of the South Pole along the South American and West African coastlines prior to crossing the opening Atlantic Ocean during the Mesozoic times and moving to its present location in Antarctica. So it's shown here migrating down the, the west coast of Africa across the Atlantic Ocean then on to Antarctica to its present location here. As well as plotting magnetic pole data, ancient latitude can also be plotted from paleomagnetic site sample data. The da data shown here was sourced from the International Global Paleomagnetic Database of Pizarevsky 2004. This data is unique in that ancient latitude calculated from site sample data represents the actual latitude of the ancient sample site and unlike magnetic pole data does not require projection beyond the site, sample site location. Latitude data is shown here plotted on each small earth model extending from the early Archean to the present day. In this figure the calculated latitude data is color coded to represent data located within the north and south equatorial climate zones shown as red dots, the north and south temperate zones shown as green dots and the north and south polar regions shown as blue dots. The, the climate zone boundaries shown as dashed yellow lines are based on boundary distributions on the present day Earth. Considering the increasing uncertainty in structural correction and magnetic screening of site sample data when moving back in time, the latitude data for each small Earth model shows a very good correlation with each, with each of the climate zones, in particular for the Cenozoic and Mesozoic eras. These ones here. From the established pole and latitude locations, it is then possible to model the expected climate zones for each of the north and south polar regions. This figure shows the anticipated north polar region centered over the ancient north pole, located on each of the small earth models. Also shown is the distribution of known glacial related rocks and formations, shown as red dots as well as the presence of known ice sheets shaded white. It is significant to note that on these small earth models, the distribution of both the great glacial related rocks and ice sheets coincide with the highlighted major glacial events as they should do. These glacial events here, here and here. The absence of ice sheets over the North Pole during the Permian and Carboniferous periods, these ones here, is shown to be the result of warm tethy sea rated currents circulating from the equatorial regions into and across the North Polar region. This North Pole observation is further quantified by the abundance of warm water marine fossil species 
present throughout the Tethy Sea regions to be highlighted in my next podcast. This next figure shows the locations of the anticipated South Pole region centered over the ancient South Pole. By definition, the North and South Polar regions must remain centered over each of the ancient poles. During migration of a continent into or out of a polar region, if conditions are favorable, the leading edge of the continent may then begin to establish an ice sheet as it enters a polar region, or the leading edge of an established ice sheet may melt as it moves out of the respective polar region. Similarly, the trailing edge of an existing ice sheet may also freeze and increase in surface area as it moves further into the respective polar region. This is highlighted by the passage of Antarctica into the South Polar region during the Cretaceous to present day times. These ones here. Where a permanent continental ice sheet was first established over Antarctica approximately 33 million years ago. You will also note that during the Ordovician, Carboniferous and Permian times, these ones here, here, here and here, the South Polar region was located over the exposed Gondwana supercontinent and hence, unlike the North Polar region, had permanent ice sheets during these times. In my next podcast, I will continue to use these small Earth models as a platform to drape additional global observational data in order to further quantify the outcomes of this modeling exercise. Following on from my previous podcasts, where I briefly touched on a proposed causal mechanism for increasing Earth radius and mass, we are now in a position to speculate further on the formation of the Earth and Moon. The modeling studies presented here have shown that the size of the early Archean Earth was around 27% of the present Earth radius, a similar size to the present Moon. Geological studies tell us that at that time, the entire primordial Earth crust comprised granite and volcanic rocks with very little sedimentary rocks and no large oceans. It is speculated from crustal and mantle temperature studies by others that the pre-Archean Earth that is, times older than 4,000 million years ago, may have been incandescent. These studies show that during these pre-Archean times, the Earth was hot enough to remain molten. By about 4,000 million years ago, the Earth had cooled enough for the molten crust to start crystallizing to form rocks and also remain stable enough to eventually form a solid crust. During the distant pre-Archean times, which was an indeterminate time span of maybe billions of years, it is speculated that the Earth-Moon system may have originally been a single molten planet, shown here at far left. By combining the volume of the present Moon and the volume of the early Archean Earth, the pre-Archean Earth-Moon system is readily calculated to have been approximately 2,100 kilometres radius at or a short, short time prior to 4,500 million years ago, which is the age of the oldest moon, moon rocks, the Earth and Moon then separated, shown here. It is envisaged that this separation may have been a, a result of gravitational instability of the more basaltic molten surface layer of the primitive Earth Moon, occurring as a result of high rotational velocity and centrifugal forces. This separation then formed a double bimodal planet. This mechanism is, is described in conventional literature as fission of the moon from the Earth's primitive basaltic crust through centrifugal forces occurring during a period of high angular momentum of the Earth moon system. It is further speculated that once separated, this bimodal planet scenario would have comprised two bodies the Earth and the Moon, of approximately equal size, around 1,700 kilometres radius. Currently, the Earth and Moon are moving apart at a measured rate of 38 millimetres per year. This more passive separation process, in contrast to a speculative impact event, 
may then go a long way to explain why the moon is currently in synchronous, albeit retrograde, rotation around the Earth, always showing the same face to the Earth. Similarly, this speculation is further supported by research in 2001, where a team from the Carnegie Institute of Washington found that lunar rocks gathered during the Apollo program carried isotopic signatures that were identical to rocks found on Earth. Similarly, in 2012, analysis of titanium isotopes from surface lunar samples and in 2016 from oxygen isotopes further indicated that the moon has the same composition as the Earth and the two bodies are indistinguishable. This conflicts strongly with the current speculation that the precursor to the moon originated far from the Earth's orbit and the moon was formed as a result of a giant impact between the Earth and a mass Mars-sized body. Not only is this isotopic signature data saying that the moon did not originate from debris left over after or fusion of a giant impact between Earth and a Mars-sized body, it is also saying that the moon and Earth may may not have been involved in heavy bombardment from asteroids or comets colliding with the Earth and lunar surface. Debris from foreign asteroids or comets would have been readily detected in the research carried out by the Carnegie Institute by showing distinctively se separate bipolar isotopic signatures, which it clearly doesn't. On an expansion tectonic Earth, during the speculated Earth-Moon separation process, it is envisaged that the hotter primitive core mantle, as well as, the, as remnants of the surface layer of the former Earth-Moon body, remained intact, forming the primordial Earth. After gradual separation of the Moon, it is further envisaged that there would have been a period of time when remnant spatter of fragments left over from this separation process would have bombarded both bodies, forming the now familiar cratering on the near side of the Earth's surface of the moon's surface. Much cooler temperature conditions on the moon may have also may also explain why the primitive moon, moon cooled and crystallized 500 million years earlier than the primitive Earth, thus preserving this period of surface bombardment and cratering. Once the Earth-Moon body separated, if that indeed occurred, it is speculated that the remaining molten core mantle material forming the prim primitive Earth then began to differentiate, whereby the remaining molten elements and minerals separated into a distinct core and mantle. Over time, surface temperatures then gradually cooled sufficiently to form and preserve a new primitive silica-rich outer crust. On Earth, during this differentiation process, the expulsion of fluids and gases from the mantle then began to accumulate in low-lying areas. This accumulation initiated formation of small shallow seas and the gases rose to form a prim primitive atmosphere with an, with an accompanying further reduction in mantle temperatures over time. Since then, the size of the expansion tectonic Earth is shown to have increased exponentially to the present day. Thank you for your interest and for those seeking more information on expansion tectonics, please visit my website or contact me at my email address shown on screen. Thank you. Over to you, David. Sorry, David, I can't hear you. Sorry about that. I keep myself muted during the time, so um, I don't. people don't hear me typing. We had a lot of interest and a lot of... Uh, uh, chatter during your talk, but uh, I think what I, there was, I don't know if you've ever heard of it. There's a guy on uh, who is a proponent of expansion tectonics, a young lad who claims to, he actually is making a model of, ex, of expanding earth by using small spheres and increasing those and doing some interesting uh, modeling, physical modeling of it. And yeah. one of the There's things he did was, yes, was yeah, there was numbers of people doing that, which is really quite fascinating. And it's always great to see people trying different ideas. But one of the things he mentioned a couple of years ago was he he claimed to have calculated the 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 uh, po the 
probability coincidence of all the um, continents fitting together on a small orb. And the number was like 96 trillion or something like that. Now, now just, just extrapolate that to uh, assembling the most ancient Archean and Proterozoic crusts together to form a complete shell. That then it becomes mind boggling. Yeah, that that is truly. And then have all the poles and the equators and all that match up. It, it, you get to a point where you you can't even. I I try to explain. You know, you always want to try try to take the other side, right? I, I after a point you can't anymore because you can't. There there is no other explanation. You just can't explain it in a different way. I mean, how coincidental coincidental is just taking the current earth and taking away the crust the the ocean floor according to its ages and everything seals up into a ball i mean that to me is how, how do you explain that away I, I i think one of the things is um there is a geologist in our group i, I won't say who he is and he is actually a fantastic uh, guy and has a fantastic stuff in other areas but you know when you you know some of these geologists make a living at subduction and so they go around, you know, and they tell people where they can make their buildings and all that. But I think the interesting part is, is that even these people I've heard say, well, you know, the, the evidence is quite good. But if you go out into the real world and say, I'm using expansion tectonics to do any geological work, depending on where you are, that could be really fatal. Um, but... One of the people I wanted to ask you about in that era, in, in that um, vein, is Doctor. I think it's Giancarlo, in Italian. Uh, yeah, uh, Giancarlo. Yeah, Giancarlo. He, yeah. from what I understand, I read many, many years ago. It was in the beginning of the two thousands when I was reading and found out about expansion tectonics. He seemed to have used expansion tectonics in his geological work. Is 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 that true? He's or a, he's a geophysicist, right? Have and he has. Yes, about, yeah. Can you explain? Number. Yeah. Can you explain that? Because that's interesting. Because when you have a theory, right? If you can actually use that theory to your advantage better than the plate tectonics, that's one more proof for that's a better model. Yeah, can I don't know that? too much about him, but I have met him a number of times and have um, presented at a, a conference in Sicily that he ran. Um, he's a physicist um, at the institute, one of the institutes in, in Rome, and uh, he's been an advocate of uh, uh, expansion tectonics for many, many years and written quite a few papers on, 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 on the subject. He has to, because he works at the university, he has to toe the line to a certain, a certain extent, but he, fortunately he's been given the freedom to follow his passion, uh, like myself, um, and he has published a number of papers uh, describing the, the geophysics uh, around the Mediterranean region. Of course, the Mediterranean, as we've just recently uh, heard on the news about the earthquake in wherever it is, uh, yes, just recently, that is a very seismically active uh, region of the Earth. And uh, um, both he and there's another fellow from... Um, in that same area, also uh, has uh, published a number of papers dealing with earthquakes and seismic activity in that area. So it's it's a case when you're looking at is this a mere coincidence that that in reality it's become it's become in my opinion it's become so hard if you really look into it with your critical mind that that this would be wrong. But people actually are using it where they can and have you used it in the field have you have you made discoveries have when when you b think of the time before you were expansion tectonics right tonicist now you are do you see things differently as a geologist when you go out i certainly do um, <clears throat> um plate tectonics in, in my 40 plus years of um pre-retirement uh, professional life, I never once used plate tecton tectonics, never once. I came across it a couple of times with other people studying areas that I'd been mapping and, and exploring, uh, and they were all, they're all basically wrong. The data was being forced into a preconceived plate tectonic model. But no, I've never used that. Um, 
if I if I was where I am now during the 1960s, you and I would be extremely wealthy people because um, I would have been able to predict some major locations of some major world class. Uh, mineral deposits throughout we the would world. be rich is what you're Focus saying <laughs> exactly where to go but unfortunately during that time that that 60 year time interval um these major world-class deposits have been discovered so uh, my work just substantiates where they are and where they are in relation to other deposits fitting con uh, countries together like so you get mineral deposits on on these uh, continents, for example, your west coast of, um, of North and South America tucks in against uh, the east coast of, of Australia, and we get very similar porphyry style um, copper lead, sorry, um, gold, copper, um, molybdenum, silver deposits uh, up and down our east coast as well as uh, the, the Americas. One of the uh, Newcrest Mining that I worked with uh, prior to retiring. They had uh, major mines in, in New, South, New South Wales with the same porphyry style uh, mineralization, world class deposits as uh, you get in the Americas. Yeah, I mean, it, it's quite amazing that um, if, if. Sorry, I just finished that. Go ahead. In a plate tectonic scenario, the two don't match. So Why is that? Why is that? Uh, they, 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 don't, they don't assemble them together as, as uh, I assemble them. Uh, um, on my models, so oh, the okay. say, bits and pieces of it that uh, match. I think another interesting part of your talk today was you're talking about the moon. That certainly generated a lot of chatter uh, because, of course, we've heard about the moon being, you know, uh, in the beginning, it was just sort of these masses that all came together and, you know, the Earth came sort of swirled and got together and the moon did and they have to be in orbit or maybe one gas turned into sort of like a galaxy where you see a little swirl and a bigger swirl. The, the, the latest, the, today's... Um, uh, science uh, cosmology has likes this idea that something came along and smashed it. They've got all the 3D graphics and you see it a hundred times and all the science evangelists are out there preaching all this. And you, I think it's interesting. You're, I, I have a, uh, we have a lot of questions. I have a lot of questions myself. Why, why you're, what, if I understand right, you're matching the, 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 the properties of the, um, the moon, the rocks on the moon to a certain time. Is, 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 is that what you did or is it, how, how did you come up with the idea? I know you said it, but maybe explain it again. How did you come up with, this is the time where this happened? And uh, did you give a reason for why it actually uh, broke off or, or because it was all one mass is what you're saying. Is that correct? Gravitational instability. Yeah. Right. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's an area that, during my my PhD studies, I, I was I was warned off speculating too much about the um, origin of the Earth, Moon, and um, uh, mechanisms and all that. But what I've found throughout my research that you just can't afford it. You have to form an opinion. And with expansion tectonics, with all my uh, modeling studies, all of the data that I use, I use the raw data and drape what I call drape it onto my models to see what the data is telling me, not the other way around. I don't use the data to fit the theory. Uh, I use the data to tell, tell me what it's trying to, trying to show me. And from that, I was able to work this data back further back and back in time with all the data that I used, the fossils, climate, um, sediments and, and minerals and oil and gas and all sorts of things like that but work it back in time to see how they physically relate to each other back in time and what <clears throat> what were the major events occurring during those specific times to have uh, formed these oil and gas for example uh, minerals are another example why did they occur, all occur at that particular moment in time working these back in time I then got to the point where um, you have uh, the Archean, the early Archean model, the first model uh, that I that I uh, um, uh, got back to, the, the oldest model I got back to, 
all of these rocks are granites and volcanic rocks. Granites and volcanic rocks form under extremely hot molt they, they, they were molten at once at a time. So and all our age dating, our age dating of rocks throughout the world go back to approximately 4,000 um, uh, million years ago, 4 billion years ago. There's a, it's a sprinkling either side of that, but approximately the 4, 000, 4 billion years ago. So you go, why aren't we seeing uh, older ages, ages older than the 4, 000, uh, 4 billion years? Like we are seeing on the moon. The moon is 4,540 or something other million years, a billion years, 4.54 billion years. Why are we not seeing that that those older 500 million year interval of time on the earth? And that's where I came up with this um, concept that the earth, well, the rocks tell me the, that the earth was molten at or, or around or prior to 4,000 million years ago. So what was happening to the moon? And then it just uh, through literature studies, I came up with that fission uh, model that has been presented by um, uh, other scientists many, many years ago, probably in the 70s or 80s from memory. Uh, and it was foofard in favour of um, these extraterrestrial impact events and asteroids and meteors and, and, and smaller, uh, small planet through bodies. And as I pointed out, the isotopic data, isotopic signatures are like DNA. DNA of my, if, I, if you take a DNA of myself and your DNA of my brother, they match up. We're, we're from the same parents. The, the isotopic signatures of the Earth and Moon uh, demonstrate that they are the same origins. They, if there was a, a if there was a, um, a small planetary body that hit the Earth at some stage and fought to form the Moon, then there would be evidence in that isotopic signatures that there would, was a different. It was a, it was came, came from a different um, extraterrestrial body. Same with the. Uh, the uh, uh, meteors and comets and such like that are uh, proposed for the uh, bombardment and uh, craters on the moon. Uh, the signatures, the isotopic signatures, are telling us that the Earth and Moon were once were are one and the same. So that's where I came up with the concept of pre four thousand four billion years ago Earth it was molten. Why? What was happening with it with the uh, the Moon? So I combined the two and came up with this um, uh, single uh, Earth-Moon body. Uh, the outer crustal layer of that primitive Earth-Moon body uh, was essentially uh, basaltic lava, much the same as our, our uh, seafloor crusts now, which is uh, a mantle material. This uh, material uh, was molten, speculative, of course, speculating that this material is molten. When you rotate a molten body at high at high speed, relatively high speed, then you, you potentially get instability. Instability will generate a wobble. A wobble with it will then uh, form it, for, form a dumbbell-shaped uh, planetary body and then ultimately separation of that body and hence the rotation of the Earth moon as we have it now. That's how I envisage it. I don't take it beyond that, but in my in my publications, I talk about I briefly talk about the potential that the molten Earth combined Earth Moon originated from the Sun, and I'll leave it there because that is taking speculation beyond speculation. I'm <laughs> you don't happy have any to rock, have, you don't have any rocks, you don't have any from, rocks the from the Sun. No. <laughs> well, maybe we've got one here. We're standing on one. Right, if right, my right, theory right, is correct, right. uh, as along as as well as the other planets within the solar system, I, I maintain that they were e uh, ejected from the primitive young sun, uh, periodically uh, ejected, similar to our um, uh, sunspot activity that we see now on a much reduced scale now, of course, but. Uh, it's one area of research that uh, could be uh, delved into, and um, this would uh, mean that um, 
the Earth Moon system is also, as well as moving away from each other and all the, the planets, they're also moving away from the Sun over time. So, your, your, your center of your feudal forces, your, your, your planetary motion, etc., is all changing over time. I haven't been able to um, resolve the maths involved in that. I'm not clever enough to do that. I like licking rocks myself, but still. Um, there, there is, um, the, or during the 70s, uh, there was a lot of effort put into um, um, rhythm. Uh, 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 what's the term? Uh, I'm having a seniors moment here. Sorry. <laughs> no, <laughs> there's okay. there's okay. seashells, uh, there's seashells and whatnot. The sea creatures, they secrete a layer, a shelly layer on a daily basis. Right. And, yeah. and over that, um, the moon, the, the, the moon, the uh, 30 odd days of the moon cycle, you get a recognizable um, uh, pattern of, of, uh, of um, uh, bands, same as uh, tree growth, etc. Your winter, summer tree growth. Um, you get uh, you can um, then uh, determine your the the um, length of a moon cycle, for example. Then you can form combine that and form a, a solar cycle, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but there was a lot of effort put into that by a number of people in the in the seventies, but it came to nothing. Uh, well, they deduced that the um, the length of the day was uh, different than what it is now. Um, can't remember whether which way around it is. Sorry, I can't remember which way around it is, but it doesn't matter. Um, but what I concluded, I tried to to crack the the maths involved and get it um, tied in with my research. But what I found was you have to make an assumption, and that is the assumption that the the uh, solar cycle is constant. And then you can work out your moon cycles and your daily cycles and so on. And so you have to make an assumption, and that's not what expansion tectonics is, is all about. Oh, that's no, that's what plate no, tectonics, what tectonics is all about. Is yeah. Uh, regarding here, this a, question, why yeah, hasn't here, the moon yeah, expanded? Yeah. The, the, the reason it hasn't expanded is because the earth, sorry, the moon took all the basalt, and the basalt has already expanded, whereas the earth retained its core mantle. And it's the core mantle, which is your very complex physics, and uh, that's where your magnetics is drawing in uh, solar particles from the sun um, and expanding with time. Whereas the moon has a very, very weak magnetic attraction and can't absorb uh, uh, these solar particles uh, anywhere near as much as the uh, Earth can. So it effectively took the dead skin off the ancient Earth earth moon system and there it stayed for there and ever and a day wow, uh, we're generating we're currently generating um a new uh basaltic crust which is which equals the seafloor crust what people don't appreciate and realize is that the seafloor crust is actually exposed mantle we talk about when when the, the geoscientists talk about the crust they talk about the continental crust and the seafloor crust as if the crust were, was something unrelated to the mantle. And then below that is the mantle. But in actual fact, the seafloor crust, the basaltic crust, is actually cooled and quenched and, and cooled uh, the mantle crust. Yeah, um, yeah, I've got some other questions as well. Um, moon expanding was one of a, a, a very... Uh, so if it is expanding, expanding extremely small is what yeah. you're saying, right? Um, yeah. And... Uh, uh, I think it, it's a a same, it's a, that goes the same with the uh, most of the rocky planets uh, of the solar system. They have very weak mag, uh, magnetic um, attraction, whereas the the giant planets, the Jupiter, Saturn, Jupiter, Neptune, etc., all have high to ver to extremely high uh, magnetism. Right, uh, and Earth is in that. the Earth to me is a a transition from the, the rocky planets to the right. giant planets and ultimately right. that uh, form a giant planet. Yeah, okay. that's very interesting. 
Mm-hmm. And the question becomes, does a Jupiter then ignite and become a sun and all the uh, moons become planets? That's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I have a, another uh, couple of uh, questions even for myself. One of the things I... Uh, is about oil. You were talking about like petroleum or, or, or that. Now, the explanation, we call them fossil fuels. And when I hear that word, I'm not sure that's the real, what's really... The real thing how is hydrocarbons. Right. Hydro- so uh, they, what people... Right. And so when we call them fossil fuels, that's a misnomer. They're more uh, what people would call abiotic. They really didn't come from a life form. Is that correct? Biotic. You're, you're referring to biotic. Fossil right. fuels. Abi- yeah, but there's a word abiotic. So oh, oil is correct. abiotic then. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll take it from there, David. Um, if you go back beyond, well back beyond, uh, back in time, beyond the Permian, uh, Carboniferous Permian, um, well, actually beyond, say, the Archean, not the Archean, beyond the Cambrian, 540-odd million years ago, there was essentially no life forms, but there was an abundance of carbon in the sediments. The Paleozoic times are renowned for black carbonaceous shales. At um, the Telfer gold mine where I work here in WA, that was uh, the, those um, regional sediments were a billion years old and we had black carbonaceous shales. So that is primary, and even into the Archean in, in South Africa, they have the black carbonation shales. Um, and this carbon is primary carbon. Once you get the uh, life forms starting to, uh, to appear and evolve, they used that primary carbon in their, uh, um, their, their physical makeup, their, their, their chemistry biochemistry they used this in their chemistry they uh, other creatures came along and gobbled them up used their their uh, uh, their, their um, carbon based carbon hydrogen oxygen uh, basic uh, compounds into their own uh, body structure and chemistry they died evolved and etc cetera, etc cetera, died um, and fell onto the uh, bottom of the ocean, etc., and accumulated. If they get uh, covered over, they get preserved, and that's where your oil and gas comes from. They get preserved in time, uh, heated and preserved in time. But if uh, they are not covered up and preserved, they are recycled. So your primary carbon is keep, keeps on recycling over and over and over and over to now. You and I are re- essentially recycle cycled carbon etc from past history um the a- abiotic um concept comes from very ancient uh oil and gas uh deposits mainly in russia from memory where they the uh the chemistry the, the chemicals with petroleum uh, pet, uh, based carbon hydrocarbon based chemicals were derived essentially from these um, uh, primary carbon carbonaceous sediments. During the Permian and Carboniferous, um, 250 to 350 odd million, 400 million years ago, there was a, a very rapid surge in evolution of plant-based and, and, and insects and so on based material um, <clears throat> over that period of time. Uh, very uh, relatively stable uh, sedimentary basins and accumulation of an enormous amount of, of uh, organic matter. And these were covered over and preserved as our fossil coal fuel deposits. Yeah, the, um, uh, let's see which way around is it. Um, Oil and gas accumulates differently, forms differently to coal. Coal forms where you get uh, uh, a a lowering of sea level. The coal is formed in the shallow regions and is covered with sediments, whereas oil and gas forms when the sea level rises and the accumulated material on the bottom of the seafloor is covered over and preserved in those 
uh, in those environments. Um, most of the the uh, coal um, it occurs within this Permian, Permian and Carboniferous periods, whereas the most oil and gas, much oil and gas, in particular gas, comes from the late Cretaceous period, and that's again in a, a different, a varying um, a sea level uh, period of time. Um, <clears throat> so, getting back to your original question. Uh, you have your primary carbon within your set, carbonaceous sediments that gets uh, used by these primitive organisms and then the carbon gets recycled over time. And so biotic and abiotic uh, hydrocarbons carbons are perfectly feasible and they both, both occur and both feasible. Um, yeah, having said that. Yeah, that's that's a it's a complicated situation. Mm. That and just then, and, very much sorry that there was a, an abundance of carbon in the sediments prior right. to that. Right, right. So, so um, another question I have is what we are actually extracting those, of course, and using those. Is, is are they being produced today? Uh, in theory, gas, yeah. oil. In theory, yes. Yeah, they're accumulating. Yes, in uh, okay. swamps, swamps, swamp gas, and and uh, peats uh, are uh, modern day equivalent. Peat is a modern day equivalent of coal, very primitive uh, uh, coal. You go peat, brown coal, black coal. So uh, peat is what's forming at the surface now. It's 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 spongy. It will burn, but it's very very low grade. Uh, brown coal is uh, peat that's been buried and squashed and dried in time but it's not buried it hasn't been heated and cooked like the black coals the black coals are deeply buried, buried heated and, and and compressed uh, over an extended period of time so the black coals are the are the, the better quality coals so yes it is in, they are occurring uh now um and the gases of course are just your swamp gases your methane as you find in in, in the swamps and and those sort of environments. So they are accumulating now, still accumulating, but not necessarily the uh, the amount that was being accumulated in, say, the thermocarboniferous. So, yeah, so one, one of the things is that we're saying we're depleting the supply, but in actuality, it's being built today. But, of course, we don't hear that, and we're not taught that. It's sort of like <laughs> not, it not happened once. Yeah, well, not I mean, as much as what we well, use. Well, sure, but. sure, exactly. But what I'm saying, though, is you're not taught in schools that, Oh, um, the Earth is producing, still producing this. We may be extracting it way faster than it's producing, but you don't hear that, right? No. <laughs> certainly, That's the black just... coals are not being produced um, right. now, as in as it was, because the the sedimentary environment conditions were totally different. That was prior to breakup uh, of the of the Pangaean supercontinent and opening of the modern ocean. So those environments environments that just don't don't exist to the extent they used to and uh, now compared to what they used to be right now another another com one of the things i've thought about uh, over the years since i've you know uh, found out about the idea of expansion tectonics and all the data that supports it how as a geologist how fortuitous do you see that the water content of the mantle seems to not be, yeah, there's a, there's more water coming from the mantle, meaning the sea floor, sea is rising according to you as a geologist. But it seems really fortuitous in some sense that this has not, you know, because otherwise we would be a, an aquatic planet, that the amount of water, is this a natural uh, consequence of our uh, atoms and the way the atoms make up the the mantle and how much water it can hold, or is this a fortuitous thing that happened on Earth? Um, I'm only speculating here, but the deeper you go down, the pressures and temperatures are become extreme. So what we think of um, water mo gas molecules probably don't exist. They're probably um disassembled into oxygen and hydrogen and um and chlorine and carbon and, and calcium and so on and so forth 
So you're getting these um, elements <coughs> uh, within the crystal lattice as well as other minerals and whatnot. When, when you um, when you when you come up through the from mantle to to crust, uh, when your depths become the same material, if you if you bring your material up further close to the surface, these uh, what we call high grade metamorphic rocks, which are subject to very high temperature and pressures. Uh, when you take that material, bring that material into a different environment, lower pressure, lower temperature, then the, the, the uh, minerals making up these rocks then alter. They alter to uh, minerals that are more stable uh, in these changing environments. And <clears throat> these same minerals, uh, when you did, uh, rearrange these, these minerals, you also get other elements that say the, the oxygen and hydrogen etc cetera, etc cetera, um, devolatilizing off these elements and hence and of course recombine to form your, your water and, and gases um, in my book I, I describe probably about um, eight or ten uh, elements gases and gases and, and various elements which naturally which naturally occur within the crystal lattices of uh, various minerals and these high temperature minerals and once you change these uh, minerals through metamorphic alteration you then liberate these minerals and these gases was the, the the water and gases of the ocean atmosphere essentially come from the from the mantle and that's the same very similar process you're moving from your dunites to your to your to your dolerites and basalts uh, the higher up you go through the food chain and uh, basaltic rocks in particular in fact all, all essentially all volcanic rocks contain upwards of 15 to, to 20 percent weight by volume of volatiles um, and as I mentioned in my previous podcast it's a, it's it's like um, a bottle of soft drink where your carbon dioxide is dissolved in in, in your in your in your drink and when you peer through it in, 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 your, in your glass bottle, you can't see any presence of this gas because as soon as you take that lid off, all the gases escape. And that's exactly the same with the basaltic lava. It's all the gases, all the water and gases escaping. The volume, volume of the water is uh, not real, it's not increasing to the point where the continents are being inundated with water is actually not keeping pace with the uh, with the continents and the continents are actually increasing their surface areas uh, which is contrary to what we're being told by climatologists that the water level that the sea waters are rising etc etc it's actually the other way around um, and an example and, and that the um, the actual continents I explained in my first podcast, I think, the actual continental crusts are rising. I'll get this into a line. But as they, as the rate of the earth changes, the continents flatten. So at the uh, outer margins, uh, the, the continental crusts retain uh, 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 some form of rigidity over a period of time, and then you get earthquakes and what, and then they gradually collapse and flatten to uh, equate with the uh, prevailing uh, surface curvature. So <clears throat> when the continents are like this, the seawater is up here. And if, if, the, uh, uh, if they retain rigid, it, it appears that it's actually getting deeper and deeper. But once the continents flatten, then of course the seawater, sea level changes and the, uh, uh, exposes the continents. Um, an example is here in uh, um, in, in Eastern Australia, the um, area around, say, Sydney. For, for compared, com the sea levels, the change in sea levels in, say, Sydney to Cairns in northern Queensland. Um, they quote that uh, as uh, Cairns is the sea levels in Cairns is increasing uh, uh, at a at a faster rate than the sea level at um, say Sydney but sea level is sea level 
sea level is uniform over the entire Earth. So it is actually the land that's changing, not the sea levels. They may rise and fall over time because of the increase in surface area, but it's the land that's causing these differences in sea level changes from one point to the other. And they're determined from tidal gauges throughout, from one point to the other. But, um, um, uh, yeah, I'll leave it there, but I can get into a lot more depth than that, but it get just get too, too complicated for, you, for your listeners. <laughs> okay, I'm mm -hmm. going to see if this is a real question because I've read it a couple of times. It may not be, I don't know. Does, uh, it says, Dr. Maxwell, do you believe that isolation by frication of paleomatic, paleo -ma uh, magnetic volatiles were triggered by the archaean cenozoic crustal resonance? Is this I a real know, question? I I yeah. don't know, but I have no idea what it's saying. It's yeah, gobbledygook. I, I, yeah, it sounds like it's gobbledygook, but I don't know. Um, so one of the things that um, also is interesting about uh, this kind of the expansion tectonics is that when the general public hears about it, it's, it's somewhat shocking to them. And I know uh, uh, some of the people here um, that were on this, this call, one guy left i know he does really great work in the area of quantum mechanics they can't wrap their head around it there's just something that it, it's so beyond um i don't know I, I don't really know what it is but i think it was it must be the same kind of reaction that it, that happened in the 1960s early 1960s i think there i think when people hear about it i mean the when i thought about it i'm like oh my gosh i'm standing on a ball that's expanding and you know it's it, it's to me it was exciting because i looked i look at it i i always i always how do you say like uh, um aristotle i always entertain whatever idea with an open mind but it seems to really hit uh, a, 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 a hit people like a some people across the face and they just totally throw it out as any any type of not comprehensive Right. Now, what, what do you, you've, you've been around that way longer than I have. What do you think that shock is? What, what is the shock that hits these well, people to we're make fortunate. them? We're very fortunate at this period of time in that our, our media and, and our graphics is at extremely high level of competence where these, these young people come through and they can do anything with uh, graphics, et cetera, et cetera. But back in the 60s, of course, you know, our technology, I remember I was given, my, my father gave me my first slide rule in 1967, and that was it's virtually the state of the art. Yeah. <laughs> and it wasn't until um, about 74 or something or other that I got my first HP 35, which was wow, a real wow factor. And, of course, um, computers and whatnot were, were still not available until later in the 70s, 80s. Uh, and, of course, by modern comparison, they're very primitive. But what I was alluding to is, and it's like Charles Darwin and uh, Alfred Wagner sort of thing and, and other uh, very important people back in time, uh, Copernicus, for example, they came up with these concepts. And it, when you think about it, these concepts simplify uh, whatever their concept is all about. Global tectonics simplifies tectonics, simplifies the earth. Basically, nobody uses plate tectonics except academic academia. And they only use, use it in academia to further the cause and to teach students. And students, student geologists virtually never use plate tectonics. Whereas if you teach them global tectonics, they were able to use it because they were able to visualize. They were able to go in and look at outcrops, look at, uh, at uh, the fine deposits and various this, that, and the other, and understand where that <clears throat> that particular outcrop or deposit was in time and space in relation to other continents around them, the, the climate, the, the, the fossils, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and, and that is that is a very important uh, aspect of geology to 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 read the, read the evidence, to read the data and the knowledge that's preserved in these rocks. And if you don't have the full picture, then all you're doing is, is having a very focused understanding, a very limited focused understanding of, of in your immediate environment. 
but, but with global tectonics, you can uh, you can then apply that to uh, further afield. And um, whereas with plate tectonics, it's a, ram, a wham bang crash bang random process. And what you see here, you can't relate to uh, anywhere else because it's a random process. Whereas expansion tectonics is an, evil, an evolving process. So uh, the difficulty, of course, is um, getting enough people on side to then educate the the, the lay people uh, to understand and and, and to um, present this this information, this this new concept, this new science in a way that they, that they can understand it. And basically, as, as I think you uh, intimated in, in your introductions a few podcasts ago, if you take an orange, for example, and you uh, orange skin, for example, and you stuff a balloon in there and, and pump it up, and then the, the orange skin will uh, eventually will stretch and eventually rupture. And the balloon will see, keep going, but the orange skin will, will remain there. And that's exactly, and you reverse that back in time, the orange will, re, will revert back to, to orange size orange. And that's exactly what expansion tectonics is all about. Exactly the same principle. The, the difficulty, difficulty for most people uh, is, um, is, is coming to grips with where this new material, come, the new matter comes from the, the, to, to increase in volume. And that, um, what I've presented here in my podcasts, I've tried to put across in a in a simplistic way uh, that I how I see it and I feel it's a very logical and understanding way to to, to go forward. Yeah, I, I think I mean, you hear that constantly in, in, in you know, uh, even a person in our chat uh, today was talking, I didn't put these up there, but I've been reading them. And it's like, you know, well, you, this is all speculation, unless you have a mechanism. And that, of course, that's what what happened when somebody actually came back and said, "Well, no, it's observational. What, what all your observations point right. to one thing, yeah. and it does not point to plate tectonics." Uh, one of the one of the things here is an, I never asked you this question. It just sort of came to my mind. Normally, when you look at change, right? Look at change in in the whatever field you're in. I mean, for instance, um, just to give an example, completely different. Um, I'm on a whole plant based diet. And then why did I do that is because I had heart disease in my family and I found out they said it was genetic. Well, it turns out that me changing my diet to plant based, my heart disease was reversed. Well, if it's the case now that we know that, for instance, um, Bill Gates finds the study, does the study to find out that diet is the number one killer in the United States. Yet what's working against that? When I when I try to introduce this to somebody who has a disease that perhaps could be caused by what they're eating, I mean, just in general, um, there's all this resistance and it comes from one place, money. Mm -hmm. That is because they haven't, even if you have an organization like a cancer where 80% of the cancers come from what we eat, in fact, carcinogenic hot dogs are on the same list by the FDA here in the United States as a carcinogenic, the same place as plutonium. Yet, when you go and you try to talk about this, or there's documentaries about people saying, hey, let's look at our diet. All of a sudden, big agriculture, big science comes in who makes lots of money off of us being sick. And, puts, and again, I'm not here to preach about that. Mm -hmm. My question is, can you take that same thing? Because it happens in physics in the same way. In cosmology, look at Halton Arp, who said, look, these galaxies and quasars are, are together. And Redshift said they shouldn't be. And that's going to throw the Big Bang out. And guess what happened? His, his time on his telescope got cut and time got cut more until eventually he couldn't use the telescope. What is there a mechanism in geology today or is it just really precarious? Because it sounds like today it's sort of like relativity. You can't find anybody who makes a living out of it. You can't find anybody making, writing their dissertations about it, but they all talk about it and they keep yeah. it going. Is, it, is, is there money behind this or is it just now all just prestige i think certainly not in australia i don't think so anyway um there's to me there's no money in play tectonics it's just academic all academic um <clears throat> for example um i was involved with um 
uh, exploration in the Northern Territory to Western Australia, which is s the central part of Australia, the other way, north west into Western Australia, probably eight, over a, a length of about 800 kilometres. And um, I think I told you the story. Um, myself and my other senior geologist with me, we both worked at mines in um, in the Northern Territory in, in the same area. And we our job was to uh, map and um, extend exploration northwest into the West Australian side. We eventually found mineralisation and it's now a, 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 a another gold mine up there. But anyway, uh, what we were finding is the, the mainly sedimentary rocks plus some volcanics with it. And we were finding the same sediments throughout this this 800 kilometer region, the same, it was the same sedimentary basin, but it had been, uh, it was also an, an active orogenic zone. An orogenic zone, I could just explain it, is a, a zone which is gone, which is like that, a, 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 and faulting, a, a right. sub-vertical faulting, crustal scale faulting, over a, a width of about 80, 80 kilometers. Um, and uh, where each of these, the, the, the mines in that region, where each of these faults cross cut some a particular strata, volcanic strata, um, that's where your mine was. And I was able to apply this and I have a mine named after me because I found a mine in that area. <laughs> it was only 600,000. Uh, now we're talking about money. Do you got money coming into your bank account from that? No, I'm not. <laughs> I was only contract contract, but anyway, what I was alluding to <laughs> was um, uh, both myself and my other senior geologists were seeing the same thing throughout this entire eight hundred kilometer region, and we were exploring from one end to the other, a different, a different, a number of different companies. And anyway, um, one of the companies, another company in the area, had. A, a young PhD student, a PhD, a recent graduate PhD, uh, it was actually, no, it was actually Mike, the company I was working for, had this uh, PhD student come in to give an alternative viewpoint. And his PhD was in the, the Northern Territory part of there, and he'd come to the conclusion that this was uh, 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 an ancient, um, small ancient crustal fragment which had come across and, and banged into where, where I am, banged into Australia, like so, fused. And uh, so um, in theory, both of these crustal fragments should have been totally different. But what my offsider and myself was seeing is we could map across this particular fault zone, 80 kilometre wide fault zone, and see the same rocks from one side to the other. So that disproved his uh, uh, theory that this was a plate tectonic, classic plate tectonic collision uh, setting. But he wouldn't have a bar of it because he did his uh, PhD studies on plate tectonics and of course he couldn't back down. But uh, anyway, <laughs> that was my story. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it is truly amazing. I think, I think what, it, what you're saying, and to sum it up, is that there really is no money interest behind it because no one's making anything off. It's very similar to, in fact, um, here, I'll put this comment up here. It says, this guy says, I, I think, or a person says, I think the oligarchy is maintaining the suprem supremacy of Einstein's bogus physics and quantum jive. Growing Earth would mean overturning that. And I, and I, yeah, and it's a, it's different, for instance, from stuff with diet. Diet, <coughs> for instance, is food and medicine. And there's a lot of money to be made in making people sick and giving them medicine. And people are profiting off of that. That's a different stranglehold than you than these people have. I think this is more precarious in some ways. And I'm it's a, identical I'm a, to Charles Darwin. It's identical to Charles Darwin. It was the church that uh, stood to lose out of that that confrontation, whereas Charles Darwin was just presenting uh, observational data, right. observation, came up with, right. with a new theory, but yeah. right. and same right. with Copernicus. Right, and, and I think, you know, the more I think about it, I'm thinking to myself, what would thrust this into, you know, 
prominence. I mean, get it, get eyeballs on it. And I really do think if if we could get together, uh, young people, uh, and and I know you've been trying this, but I, I think we need. You know, I don't know. I'd be happy to to put together a group and try this again because I, I work with computers. That's my job, and um, I know you you and other people have been working on or looking at making computer models. If for some way we can take a global uh, Google Earth and be able to change its radius and be able to map things onto that, I think if we were to be able to come up with a an open source, um, you know, a database that would be able to be plotted upon a growing sphere, a growing Earth, where people could go and put those layers on it and make this accessible to the people. I think that, you know, people would go in and start doing that. People like your friend who was the nut tree guy, right? He'd love, mm -hmm. he'd be able to get in there, you know, make a login. You know, the question it is, is where does that come from? To do that from a grassroots, you know, group of people without any funding. Now, if we were to get funding and be able to get programmers to just jump through the hoops that we need and create that and create a website so anybody could log in, create a, create a um, you know, their username, and then start to be able to put their own uh, layers on that so that, you know, study. So what you would have are, you would generate a massive amount of new interest in so many areas that really are sort of dying. The only, the only area I see in paleo anything are, you know, finding new dinosaurs. And that's becoming like, you know, we found so many and you find another femur the size of, you know, two people standing up, you know, and, and, you know, no one ever questions whether or not these animals could ever survive in today's gravitational mm -hmm. field. But I mean, just the amount of interest that people would in the natural world be able to walk out in from flora <laughs> to fauna, to the geology again, to physics, to cosmology. How do we explain this? Can we, can we come up with real ways to reproduce this or, I mean, it just seems to be wait, something waiting to explode. And I think, you know, if we could get a couple million dollars from somebody and, and, or a grant that would <coughs> allow us to come together, get programmers, lay it out, because I'm, a, you know, again, I'm a software engineer. I would just, you know, I'm busy doing it's, my stuff. It's but doable. It's doable. Get, yeah, it's because doable. I do it in the, in the graphics industry all the time with the, the, the of course. movies and whatnot. But um, I what I generate a huge amount of interest. Yeah, what I, what I've found is um, conferences, for example, just do not work. What right. we what we it's a gathering of like minded people, right. generally now elderly, and they're pushing their own wheelbarrow, uh, yep. which is a I don't know if you have a term there, pushing your own wheelbarrow. Yeah. Um, and they're just saying the same things over and over and over again. And right. I, I've been to a number of these international conferences all over the world, as, uh, as you probably know, and right. Uh, right. they just don't generate any interest and you don't just don't get, it across, get across them. So uh, my... Um, Thoughts are that exactly what you were saying is get together. Uh, well, to get this stuff in a in a Google Earth type form, right. where people can interact with it. Right. Um, I have a long term ambition, and I'm not a computer scientist or anything like that. Where whereby all these all my models are in a uh, in a in a Google Earth type format. Um, the particular researcher maybe uh, may have found a, a new dinosaur fossil, as you mentioned. I'll plot it. Oh, there it is. Okay. And there's a database of, of fossils. There is an international database of fossil locations, thousands of them. I, I think I plotted 10,000 of them on, on, uh, on my models. And on, on my next podcast, I'll show you a selection of them. Uh, but, okay, here are all the existing um, locations, and this is where how it relates to that continent there and that one over there. 
uh, and this is how the this is where the ancient uh, sea was. Uh, so this, so therefore, this uh, dinosaur that I've just found uh, lived in a near shore environment uh, with lots of which in tropical environment, lots of vegetation, ferns, and da 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 da. Um, and that, to me, that it's be invaluable to geography and paleogeography and and uh, those particular sciences. Um, not necessarily the the actual uh, say mineral exploration history. One of my um, early on, I was um, I was aiming my my promotion towards the mining industries, but um, plate tectonics and expansion tectonics uh, are, are not really relevant to a, a, a mine scale scenario where they're focused on finding the next ore body finding extensions on on existing mineralization they're just not interested in knowing where that fits globally da 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 having said that i did work in international search with newcastle mining there for a number of years and we were and i, I was able to um plot uh not discoveries but mines existing mines and exploration uh, uh, prospects from all over the world onto my models and I gave a demonstration to my peers um, to say, hey, look, this is how they all fit together sort of thing. So that was just a just a, a friendly interaction and they were quite, um, quite uh, impressed with it. So, uh, yeah, so, uh, so, yeah, so it's a matter of getting this information out to uh, enough people to start then forming that cascading rolling uh, motion to get it uh, promotions and well, then if you look yeah go ahead sorry uh, and then um to overwhelm plate tectonics plate tectonics cannot offer they just can't offer anything to the general public it's just a, a hairy fairy la -di da theory out there in academia land and the average person in the street just can't comprehend it accepts it because they can't comprehend it journalists and and, and writers such like are, are the worst people because they just run with that stuff and bring up all this uh, uh movie crap with this asteroid and cracking continents and all this. i right. just go oh no right <laughs> that happens but uh yeah so focusing on on uh the the the, the younger um uh um so this technology literate younger set uh yeah so if it's it was, we can get it out and promote it then it, it's that's the way to well, go you have to look at today you have to look the way it works so so if you look at you look i'm at, getting, I'm echo, getting on echo on this somebody um i'm gonna mute you here just real quick okay because that way it's not going to echo there so um what I, I think one of the things is today is how does the world work? Like you said, you have conferences and conferences. Um, they actually are, are good. Like when we have our conferences, it just gets people together to be able to discuss face to face. And it's a lot different than when you meet online. So if you are trying to find like minded people, that's one thing. Now, trying to get it out to the rest of the world is a whole nother endeavor. And the way I look at it is if we had the ability, the way it works today is people have open source software or things that people can use. And that's what Google does. For instance, if we could find and get somebody in Google interested in this project, that is, here's the software and to get some young mind who looks at it and goes, oh, this looks really interesting, then put together a team and then to try to direct this. Now, if, whether or not we would have to get actual funding for it, you know, you can even do that online. You can make a project. So I think the first step would be is to look out out in the world form people to put people together we have a lot a lot of younger people in our group a lot of software people in our group <clears throat> in fact um a numerous uh, lori gardia is one of them and she does a lot of work with um software uh, jeff yee who has his own theory of how the world universe works he also has people you know maybe he would know but we would be able to try to put together a committee that who, who the idea would be meet regularly and try to come up with here is the software where we could look to work with, like Google. Can Google we model? Can, can yeah, we Google model? Works very well. Yes. Uh, I've, the, I've, 
but, yeah, they, but they don't have they don't have this size change though, do they? No, do they have the? I was about to say, I've draped. I've I've got my um, earlier models, which don't include the uh, uh, continental geology. My early models in uh, map format, and I've been able to drape that directly onto Google, and I'll, I'll send you the the, the uh, links to them. Uh, to, show, to see and you can actually rotate these round on screen but what you're doing is you're just retaining the constant size earth uh, the google earth size and just draping your maps on that so your maps are increasing in scale increasing decreasing in scale whichever way but the earth is staying the same um, what would be ideal would be for the google earth to change in size back in time that's what i'm saying yeah and, maps. And, what and it's the, beautiful they're actually beautiful maps they work really well no what i'm what i'm th saying is is because i work with open source in fact my friend and i have just uh, put out into the real world a com computer programming language in the open source world and what happens is if you get people who are interested in that open source project people will contribute to it. Now, if Google Earth, I don't know enough about Google Earth software to know whether all of it is available. Because if all of it's available, all the code, sometimes you have the ability to use it, but you can't mm -hmm. get at the engine for it. Mm -hmm. If you get, ahead, get the engine, you could then go in there and have somebody modify it so that you could change the radius. Now, if you can change the radius, all you would have to do is have a scale there and you would literally take the max low sizes and have it so that when you're looking at it, what, what happens with software? This is the way it works, just the way it works. Let's say all of Google Earth is available, all of its code, meaning every line of code that makes that thing work is available. You then go to GitHub, which is a place where all open source software is there. Anybody can get it. What you do is you fork off. Fork off means you make a copy of it in your own little world in GitHub. Now I can modify it. I can put, change the rate. I can do anything I want with that code. Now, if it's a case that we would fork something off of Google, Google uh, the world, that is, fork another branch. It's just like evolution. Here's a new branch. And that branch would take... Um, and add the ability to change the radius. And the radius then would be scaled, right? That you would say, okay, we know these. Then what you would do is that you would have to make it so that everything you plotted on there would be related to a time. So when you plot something, all you would have to add to all of those plots that James Maxwell puts on there or drapes on there, a time stamp of yeah. when. And then what happens is when someone would go into this newer version of Google Earth and they were going to see, they move it back, they're going to see the plot of what you have on there as there. And what we would do is you would just keep that plot even though it would be shrinking. Then eventually what would happen is that you would add one more thing to that model, not just the changing of it, but to be able to literally put dots on and outline coastlines, areas. Mm. So what happens is when you put that area there, you can then make the area, when it goes smaller, you can make that same area, you would label those points to be the same, and so when you would flip between those, you could even write an interpret interpolation, meaning what happens is if I make this a continent and then I make one smaller, and I go and I put all the little dots on that, I can make the computer make the in between it, what we call tweening it, making it in between. So those two modifications onto the software would allow us to build a Google Earth where you could not only change the shape and plot stuff on it, and those plots would just have a time frame. So and then you could, you know, move the slider, but you could eventually, instead of draping things over it, go in and make a layer on there just like you can go into zoom i can get my phone on right now and go into to uh, zillow is a program for houses right and if i want to go onto a map i can literally on my ma on my phone draw a, a, an area that area is remembered by the program and then it goes and finds all the houses in that area that i'm interested in now those things are po totally possible so there is a way that we could come up with how to do this if and that's a big if 
Google has every line of code available for their the earth. Yeah. And that's yeah. and all we would then do is have to find people who who could actually program that. And then what we would have is you'd have a website on expansion tectonics, right? That's what you call it. You would then have it hosted there the on a server where all the data's sitting and then people can go in, create their login, do what stuff, you plot stuff on it, you would make even areas. So your area interpretation would be maybe different from another's, and then you, all the people could argue about you know, what's better and see that. I mean, mm -hmm. that to me would break it open because all of a sudden you've got a place where any Yahoo can log in, look at it, change it around, get the idea. And when people start seeing that working and people's interest come, young people, then all of a sudden you've got paleo gravity as a degree at a university. <laughs> there you go. I saw all the problems. We no longer need James. James, thank you. We don't want you to speak anymore. I solved everything. No, I'm kidding. You do need my, <laughs> you do need my formula. Oh, of course you do. Absolutely. Don't believe me. I, that's always, no, no. I'm sorry, but you, you can't extract yourself from what you've done for the world, no matter what you would want to do. You could go nuts. You could go nuts and, 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 and become loony and do something stupid, but it doesn't matter. You've already given us what you've given, so you can't take that away. It's in a book. Yeah, I think um, on my uh, webpage, the, the work that um, John Eichel has done for me on right. that, web page is, is uh, brilliant in that uh, scroll up and down the time frames and it just you just there are any static images but it brings right. up all <coughs> all the globes um, uh, and you get the impress that that uh, sensation that the impression that it's changing radius and time of course of course and uh, plotting the same information on that that's a very it's it's uh, it's a lovely very interesting um, way of displaying it but it but it is crude compared with what could and should be done in eventually. Yeah, I think what I'll do is uh, on the last talk, what I'll do is I'll uh, maybe, <coughs> maybe actually you could uh, demo that, right? You mm -hmm. can put that on your screen and show people, you know, after your last talk uh, yeah. so people can get an idea of that. But I truly do think, I'll, I'll, I'm going to investigate, I don't know if anybody here is taking a look, but investigate the, the idea of making this, this type of open source project forking off a a Google Earth and and going from there. Uh, there may be other programs that would you know be available, but I think that would be the best because it's sort of, you know. And then you know try to check people out. Try to you know I can go snooping in the uh, software world and try to knock on some doors of people who are in charge of that. You know maybe maybe they don't have to necessarily agree with it, but maybe they'll think oh this is a really interesting project regardless of whether they agree with it, right? I mean, a programming challenge to, to do that. The modifications aren't such a, a big thing. And then if we can get a uh, open source and a group doing that, that I think. Uh, and then worst case, we can always find out that it's totally doable, that maybe we don't have the manpower to do it. And then at that point, you use something like GoFundMe or, or Patreon or whatever mm -hmm. to then have people. It all comes back don't, to funding, doesn't it? It all comes back to funding. Yeah, no, but it doesn't always, not, not always, because we are doing an open source project and many open source projects um, are done by people, people are programmers. There's a lot of coders around the world, people mm -hmm. pro, who program in programming languages. And we are, the, you know, they'll come in and um, we, I'm a part of a supercomputer group with the supercomputers available to everybody to use. You can put, you can download it and build yourself a supercomputer. Super and the thing is, is that we have people contributing to that who are not being paid to do that. Mm -hmm. And so those things exist. And I think if we, put together all the pieces and have a what we have and, and the way to modify it available. We'll see if we can do it just with our, you know, volunteers or we may find out, okay, let's get some programmers. How much money do we need to have them do these tasks? Because on GitHub, you can say, do this task. And if that task gets, you know, we can get some uh, donors, you know, maybe we can actually have some programmers uh, actually do that. So that's yeah. a possibility. Um, let's see here. We have uh, anybody raising their hand that want to talk to directly with uh, in our green room, uh, want to talk or question or discuss anything with uh, Dr. Maxlow. I do see him. Again, what I would ask is that people, you know, try to keep this to expansion tectonics. The idea is to keep that on point. So um, I saw Steve Scully, so I'm going to bring him up. Um, and I, I don't know, Ian, did you raise your hand as well? 
or no? He, he did. Okay. So uh, I'm going to bring some other people up here. Uh, let's bring up here uh, Steve Scully. Hey, Steve. Let's right. see, make sure he's there he is. And we are with the famous James Maxlow. You can always say, you know, when you're in 97 and we're, he and I are gone that you talk to a very famous person and it wasn't me. <laughs> so go ahead. Uh, go ahead and uh, make your comment. Or... Well, I, I mean, I, I come from, a, I'm a engineer, but I have a physics model and I come from that angle where essentially what I concluded through physics was that magnetic fields are particles that travel in an orbital, in a figure eight orbital pattern. And so what that means is that these particles merge at the center of a body. And so I, part of what it, I've kind of, when I was exposed to expanding Earth, I was like, well, clearly it expanded. And I think that the mechanism is related to that the Earth is, essentially when the Earth rotates, it causes a vortex of this flow of ether particles that merge at the center and that p produces what we observe as the inner core and then uh, that essentially produces uh <laughs> i was leaning into it, <laughs> it produces a uh, matter that then like build up pressure inside the planet because it it uh because of the, the this production of mass and so it essentially at some point reached a point of instability where the, like it fractured and evidence is everywhere and I, so i just wanted to like throw that out there because i don't i haven't seen anyone talk about that concept of uh, mm -hmm. figure eight of uh orbitals which is important because it's it's how gravity causes a magnetic field which is tying fundamental forces and it relates to this so i think it's uh i just wanted to point it out just see what you guys think because i don't know how tied you are to like the specific mechanisms i mean i've looked um, at it yeah, i've been through all of it essentially all of the mechanisms available <clears throat> one of the things that we have to keep in mind is but well, there's a number of options yeah you have a constant mass or you have a constant density density equals mass over volume you, you change your volume by changing your density or changing your mass um, changing uh, retaining a constant mass for example uh, means that your density is is just just enormous during the, the uh, R key and something like 50 times what it is now from from memory same with the surface gravity, it just becomes un, 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 unacceptable. So um, in, in my, my modeling within my book and research and uh, thesis, I eventually adopted a constant, uh, a constant density scenario or constant density to slightly changing density. Uh, and the, the uh, changing mass over time, because in order to <coughs> increase mass, you have to have input of material, input of of, of uh, your primary particles, and your, I presume your, your ether you're talking that you're talking about is the same as your um, plasma. So um, electrons, uh, protons, and and all the various particles involved with that. All I'm, uh, as I mentioned in my previous. Uh, uh, podcasts well i'm uh, i'm you I'm, I'm magnetically attracting solar particles from that, that originate from the sun into the earth itself by the auroral uh, polar regions uh, and generating uh, new matter within the um, core mantle region through that so how that fits with what you're saying at I don't the boundary know. so so at the boundary rather than at the center low Yes, that's right. The, the D layer, essentially the D layer, layer which is a highly reactive uh, layer. So that's so the, the D core. layer. What I think it's just to let people know, yeah. D layer is a is a layer inside the Earth, right? There are yeah. certain places, mantle and going down core, D layer. Yeah, so core man. Right. Upper lower, upper middle and lower mantle, and then there's a D layer before you get into the the actual core itself. Yeah. And that's a, reactive uh, region through there and that's where i speculate that they that matter is being generated from these the input of these uh, uh solar 
solar wind related uh, particles. So, so I think one of the things is, Steve, is that we as people interested in physics and models of the universe, my father and I have a particle model, we don't, we don't deal with this a whole lot. But, you know, you have to start thinking, okay, if this is what geologists are thinking who really study this, how is it, how can that be explained? And one of the things that uh, Dr. Maxwell came to us was, how do you, you know, he wants to know if there's, is, what are some of the ideas? How does this, how would this work? And it's really still open, it's an open book. Um, I think the idea, a lot of people do agree with the idea that the sun is blowing things apart into, sub, you know, atoms into subatomic particles. Yeah. And, then, and then there are, there are ether models, there are particle models, there are lattice models. There's a lot of different models even below that. And you, you, I, I, the way I look at it is every model of the universe, um, we have a model for magnet, magnetism, electric, electricity, gravity, and light. I mean, we do. Those models are going to have to deal with this because these things, you know, the idea that the Earth isn't in great gaining in mass is really hard to dispute. The, the yeah. observational evidence is yeah. just way too big. So we have to get over this idea. You know, to me, it's like, People say, oh, I can't accept it. To me, it's like, no, this is a great mystery we can solve, right? Mm -hmm. And I think, I think yeah. the idea of, of us, um, you know, one of the things we could even do is to have maybe even a session of people, maybe I'll get all the people who have a, an idea of how mass could increase and we could have a, you know, presentation. Each person will put forth their ideas and just, you know, see what's going on. So, okay. so I guess what I'm, I'm, I'm seeing from you is that, and I know there's a lot of the people that have been chomping at the bit uh, well, to talk about their idea of mass increase. And the reason I don't do too much about it is because we want to talk and focus on the evidence and Dr. Maxwell talking yeah. about it. But I'm really thinking we've got so many people wanting to, to speak about that. that yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, sure. I'm sorry, but I, I just, please, <laughs> please. Yeah. So, so you're saying, though, that it's forming at the D, the D what is it, prime layer? But the mm -hmm. thing is, like, that's not where the focus would be. So, first of all, when I say ether, I'm talking about smaller particles, like re infinitesimal, down down to nothingness. And they're so small that relative to them, Earth is infinite in mass. And so, basically, they're stuck in an the, orbital. They're not coming from the, the sun. The sun is sending out bigger particles, more massive particles, ones that don't make it through, like a neutrino. And these smaller particles, though, like they, they merge at the center, exactly at the center. And that's why there's an inner core, because of where the electromagnetic field merges. I'm just saying, I feel it's, it's important because it's where the focus is. Whereas if it's at, at, a, at this like shell, there's no focus. The focus is like at the center. Yeah, you know, and and I think what what in, in in the end in the end what I think is 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 what we have to understand is there's going to be a lot of different people with a lot of different models about how to explain this, and I think that is, you know, they're open open for discussion, and I think we're going to have to have a place to do that because that seems like James, like a lot of people are are, are you know have their explanations for that. But thank you very much, Steve uh, Scully, for coming on. Um, I, I know, Ian, did you want to come on real quick? Is it something urgent or you didn't want to? Yes, no, uh, yes. Okay, I'm gonna bring him up. I, Go ahead. I, I had a number of points, but the, the time is short. So just one, one point perhaps, um, James. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering if in your analysis over, you know, 4.5 thousand million years, um, you've taken into account the secular variations uh, in the orbit of the Earth um, over that period. For example, things like precession and mutation. Have they become apparent? Uh, probably, but I haven't done anything about it. Okay. Well, I, I think that's fairly brief. Yeah, so, uh, I was a bit brief there, but I think yeah. because, because I'm changing radius, <coughs> radius and the size of the Earth over time quite considerably, um, how you go modeling this, I just have have no idea. So I, I'm too involved with uh, and, and my you know, timing and whatnot, too involved with the, the geology, the geoscience, the geosciences rather than getting involved with the 
the um, astrophysics physics and and cosmo uh, co all that sort of physics involved yeah, with, the magnetic uh, variations yeah you, yeah, yeah, you yeah. Have a slide on that so that really sparked my mind in regard to other phenomena which have changed yeah. over time yeah yeah i've simply used the existing databases the international databases of, of, of the uh, paleomagneticians to uh, to determine the poles and whatnot uh, there is evidence in the uh, distribution of these um, these ancient poles to suggest that there is precession in in that the fact that in each of the model each of my the the, the data plotted on each of my models there was a 25 degree radius in the, in the distribution of this data which is uh, exactly coincident coincidental with the present day Earth where there's a 25 degree uh, distribution of uh, ancient uh, of, of uh, magnetic pole plots, which suggests your, your precession, etc., etc. So there's evidence uh, in in the 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 modelling of the, the pole data to suggest that uh, that occurs uh, back in time, but to actually model it, it's just uh, well beyond me. I, th I think one of the things, Ian, that I can say, um, it was pretty interesting. I was I first started in, in physics dissidents back in the early 90s when I met a physicist from Argentina who showed Einstein wrong, special relativity, also why the neutrino was postulated and that doesn't exist, all those kinds of things. But one of the interesting things from that and his, his um, uh, disputing of the special relativity and, and removing the problem with it and then coming up with a Newtonian answer. One of the things that came out of it was he talked about mass increase. And one of the things that, that special or general relativity or special relativity was supposed to uh, explain was the, per, uh, the perihelion advance of like Mercury. And uh, of course, if you do the calculations, it doesn't really fall on a bit. What his explanation was way back, this is a couple, about 20 years ago, was that mass was increasing. And this was before I even knew, James, about expansion tectonics. This is a physicist who said, explained the perihelion advance is, is sort of the way, you know, the, the elliptical orbit doesn't stay in one place. It's like, you know, in, in, the, in the change in that, James, is not Newtonian, it's not Keplerian. And so the idea was, well, we don't have an explanation using Newton, so there must be something going on. And relativity was supposedly came and solved the day, but it didn't solve the day because it only did Mercury and it wasn't that close, actually. They fudged it. So here was a physicist who came up with the idea of mass increase, then said and showed in calculations, I don't have those, how that was, was for instance, the Pioneer slowdown. The, the Pioneer spacecraft is slowing down. This physicist said, well, the, as, as the solar system is gaining some mass, you know, that this was happening. So it was interesting that actually a physicist related this idea of mass increase two orbits and came to that conclusion without knowing anything about expansion tectonics. He wasn't talking about mass increase, David, with with speed. He was talking about, you know, absolute mass increase of planets. Yes, he was. He was. He okay. was. And, the, and, and what he was saying, it was because he believed gravity was caused by a force and that no force could be magical. It's got to be created by some type of particle. Now, whether or not what that was, you know, like a graviton, um, that was that was something, but okay. actually, the, incidentally, there's less than 0.1 percent difference between the calculation using Newtonian mechanics of the advance of the perihelion of, of Mercury and what we actually observe. So it's it's a very small amount. It's yeah. sort of blown up. You know, people say, "Oh, Newton, Newton says the thing doesn't possess at all," and general relativity gives you this magic figure of 43 arc seconds per sec century. There's actually yeah. over 6,000. Arc seconds per century observed from the Earth. Yeah, yeah, and it, it, that happens a lot where you have um, these small, minute things that people get all hissy fit, you know, about. The same way, the same way can be looked at as the um, dark matter, which they throw out there, right? Dark matter exists because we can't explain the uh, the speeds of the stars at the end edge of a galaxy. It turns out that that it's because we are treating the galaxy as a sphere. And when you do that, Newton explains it. We have several people in our group who have explained the speed of the stars using Newton. So any other comment before you go here, because we're wrapping it up? No, no, uh, thank you again very much. I, I think the second lecture. Just, uh, I think apart, 
It's past it's midnight. Just, uh, He's got to go by bed. Yeah, yeah, he did. <laughs> thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Ian. And I do want to say, say very, very much. Thank you so much again. Go to go to bed. Uh, I will see you in a couple weeks. Um, yep. We will we we will have somebody else on here. But I want to uh, thank you so much again for these presentations. If you happen to miss it, we do have it recorded. But I'm going to say good night to you and then uh, sign off so you can go to sleep and uh, do a few wrap up a few things before you go. But thank you so much. Uh, uh, did, did you want to have any last words? Or are you just good night? <laughs> Good night. <laughs> okay. Good night. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very, thank you. So um, again, uh, I want to I want to thank everybody from the Dissident uh, Science Channel for tuning in. Also from the J the John Chappelle Natural Philosophy uh, Society. If you want to go to our YouTube channels, you can can by going to youtube.naturalphilosophy.org. Or you can go to youtube.dissidentscience.org and you can see our channel and see all these great videos. This one's being recorded to both of those channels simultaneously and to this Facebook page as well. If you haven't checked out our websites, you should uh, go to naturalphilosophy.org. You can join in amazing conversations about amazing subjects where the best critical thinkers in the world do meet. And if you're new to it, you can go to sciencewoke.org. It is the only magazine, online magazine for critical thinkers. And you don't have to be a, a PhD in physics to uh, read these articles. They're very easy to read and very, uh, very interesting. And uh, of course, um, I will, I'm going to put up a few videos here just about our organization. So here we go. So yeah, check us out. Um, uh, there's a lot of great information there. And of course, what did I do? I forget the stinger again. So I'm going to put this up. This is uh, James when he gets goes back and watches it. This is what I'm supposed to put in the beginning, and I always forget. <laughs> Well, the good news is next week we're going to be having uh, Dr. Glenn Borkert. He's going to be talking about infinity. If you don't know about infinity, you need to know about infinity. Why? Is because many of the, in fact, um, a, a lot of the new models of the universe do base uh, themselves in the infinite universe model, meaning there is no the smallest particle. Um, my father and I, with our... Uh, uh, model, the particle model. We also subscribe to that. And so if you don't know about it, check it out. Uh, it's going to be next, I think the this November 7th, I believe, at 10 a.m. right here. You don't want to miss that. And then after that week, we'll have James D uh, Maxlow on his last talk in his series about uh, expansion tectonics and right after that we're going to have another well I think maybe two weeks after that we have a talk by uh, Dr. Glenn Borkert and I'm also looking to have uh, George Coyne back on and talk about the Big Bang um, and but um, actually Borkert's going to be talking his second talk is about the Big Bang whoops I forgot that and so if you are a person who's thought about the Big Bang and all the problems the Big Bang has well we're going to be uh, talking to Glenn Borkert about that. And of course, Steve Bryant's going to be coming on in his Disrupting Physics book. If you haven't checked it out, look up Steve Bryant and read his book on uh, um, uh, Disrupting Physics. He gives an alternative to relativity and just shoots relativity down, even though his Facebook page has 20 million viewers. Uh, anyways, thank you so much, all of you, for your patronage. Remember um, to join our organization. Go to naturalphilosophy.org. Um, 
And uh, you can go to that. Here we go down there, naturalassets.org. Join our organization and and consider becoming a a paying member. It's only $35 and on up per year. You can donate to what you want. Um, it's greatly appreciated, uh, the donations, because it keeps us going and keeps shows like this going. So please consider that. Uh, pa- your patronage is very important. And if you are a member of our group and have been for many years, please make sure you log in and sign in new to our our, our our new website and and make sure I'll, I'll put this up there. This this is it, and get yourself signed in, get your profile made, and please consider getting your membership. It will uh, renew annually and remind you. But like I said, it's greatly appreciated. And of course, I'm Dave D. Hilster. I am your science therapist, trying to get you to the promised land of becoming a critical thinker. Don't listen to anything I say or your professors or the university. Stay thinking. Stay thinking, stay uh, critical. I'm Dave D. Hilster. Ciao for now.